Hello, everybody. We are opening the doors for you to connect. I will just give you a couple of seconds. So welcome to a digital ship webinar on simulation and prediction, getting beyond performance monitoring. Our guest speaker today is Bastian Genke, Senior Product Manager at Navis, a company that is one of the pioneers using simulations to make predictions. You will have the opportunity to ask questions anytime during this webinar. Simply send them via the Q&A box. And now I think we are ready to start with uh, Carl Jeffrey, founding editor of Digital Ship, who will introduce us uh, deeper into the topic. Okay, so our subject is how we can do simulation and prediction for vessel performance. So we want to go further than just talking about data gathering or performance monitoring. So simulation and prediction is about getting a sense of what would happen if we're going to change the speed, change a route, use different fuels or make investments in our ships. For example, we want to know if we uh, make this change, is it going to keep us in the A to C bands of the carbon intensity indicator in 10 years time? As you probably know, we've got lots of rules coming in about reducing emissions, which may involve spending money, such as on lower carbon fuels or energy efficient methods. And you'll be much happier if you have a sense of what returns you're going to get before you commit to spending the money. So just talking about the terminology. So in our webinars, we've used lots of different terms. We use the term modeling about building computer models to get a sense of how different vessels are going to behave. And we've talked about machine learning to develop the model. So simulation, we could define that as a sort of specific sort of model which we can use to see what's going to happen. But they all kind of fit together, all, all these methods. They're all computer methods to try and work out what's going on. Our company speaking to today, Navis, has made a carbon intensity indicator simulation service, which is going to simulate what your CII is likely to be and what it might be if you take steps to reduce it. Currently, they're trying it out on a few clients, but they're going to launch it in the market very soon. Our speaker today, Bastian Genke, is the architect and the brains behind the new service. He's senior technical product manager for vessel and fleet performance at Navis, and he's got a degree in maritime and ship operations. He's based in Flensburg, which is on the Germany-Denmark border. So we start the talk. You, you can enter questions in the Q&A box at any time, and there should be plenty of time to, for questions at the end. And I'd like to invite Bastian to start his talk. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carl. Thanks for having me today. So let me start sharing my screen. Yep. So you should be able to see my presentation right now. Yep. Yeah, let me start to give you a little bit of a regulatory uh, framework update here. I guess everyone is pretty much aware of uh, the CRI regulation, but- uh, Oh, sorry, we can see the regulatory presenter view window on the, you're sharing that as well, do you want to? So- That's yeah, so it's gone now. Now it's gone. Now you see only my presentation, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so I guess everyone is pretty much aware of the regulatory framework behind uh, when it comes to the CII, but um, to give you a quick update and to get everyone on the same page, actually I would just briefly to go through that as well. Um, so uh, starting in 2018, at first the European Union and then the IMO DCS followed in 2019, uh, started to look at CO2 emissions in the shipping industry. So it started with the monitoring, reporting and verification, uh, followed by the fuel oil data collection system from the IMO. But um, so far, there was no further action required beyond the monitoring. So data have been collected um, and summarized and analyzed and then been submitted to the regulatory bodies. Um, this all was relying on historical data and there was no other action required rather than uh, submitting the data. But with the initial calculation of the EXI and the following annual CII being computed, um, which is an upcoming regulation starting to get into force in 2023, the IMO has introduced a system where vessels are being put in categories and there's a dynamic rating scheme behind. That actually means uh, the vessel are forced to stay above a certain threshold. And in the future, this dynamic rating scheme will mo get more narrow over time. So from here, it's basically required to take permanent action uh, to stay in the required category of the rating. And that's what's made the CRI totally different uh, from the 
previous regulations like MFV MODCS where it was purely about reporting. So now actually action has to be taken. Uh, from 2024, the ranges will go to get more narrow, so that actually um, requires owners to stay permanently ahead, and that's also why we do think that uh, it is not enough anymore to stay with monitoring. We have to look into the future, so we want to talk a little bit about uh, prediction and simulation in that regard. Having a little closer look regards to the CII, uh, here's a nice visualization uh, how the required operational CII um, schema is developing over the years. You can clearly see that it gets narrow. In 2025, there's the first review planned. Uh, and within the period from 23 to 25, uh, there's an annual CII rating and followed by EMP audits. And this is actually uh, the, the yellow area is the middle of area C where the vessels are required to stay in. So on the right hand side, uh, you can actually see uh, the different factors which come into that regulation. On the one hand, we have this required CRI rating where the vessel needs to stay. We have the reduction factors over the, over the, over the next three years, uh, making the thresholds more narrow. And we have the annual emissions which needs to be submitted and which uh, will be the basis of calculating the annual CRI value. There's a little bit uncertainty at the moment in regards to certain correction factors. Um, so correction factors, example given for refrigerated cargo or uh, any other uh, heating systems and so on, which also um, leads to higher emissions uh, are currently planned and proposed from the IMO, but not yet um, uh, completely um, into force, not yet completely clarified, as well as some exclusions uh, for certain short voyages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are additional things which are coming on top in the future and makes the entire thing more complex. And of course, also the reporting and the analysis of the CI data more complex. Um, current state is that there are some proposals in the market which we can work on, but it's not yet finally decided. So let me come at that point to the uh, next section, getting beyond the monitoring. What we think uh, is that we need a new approach. So the CII will have significant business impact and it requires definitely more than monitoring. However, monitoring is of course the basis still. Uh, that's actually where we get the data from. Most of the companies are collecting data uh, latest since 2019, since the IMO DCS is in place. And this will be of course required in the future as well. Um, the upcoming uncertainties regards to the different um, correction factors and skip voyages and so on uh, require you to have a bit more flexibility in that reporting so that you can add flexibly additional data if you require them. To keep the emission compliance standard over time, you not need to be aware of the current situation, but you also need to be aware of the future situation. That brings us to the second point, which is the prediction, which should make you aware that actions are required to move into a higher category or to stay into the good category if you're already in there. Um, since the thresholds are getting more narrow, the prediction will show you at what point in time actions needs to be taken to still stay in the same situation. However, that's not enough uh, because just predicting that at one point in time you will get into trouble will not bring you out of that situation. That's why we think simula simulating the results of plans which you have uh, regards to the evolving emission compliance um, should be a possibility you can play around with. So multiple scenarios uh, which you may want to do in order to reduce your emissions should be simulated into the future. And then you should get an updated prediction and see what this result actually means regards to your CII. I will come into more details. And I would like to talk a little bit about the best practices which we see um, should be in place today. On the monitoring side, of course, the key still is to have a validated and complete data foundation. That basically means uh, data which being collected on board the vessels should be uh, validated, verified, uh, certain plausibility checks shall be carried out so that you actually have a good data foundation where you can really rely on and you can really work on. And besides the completeness, of course, the quality of the data is still the key here. That said, you need a flexible reporting system uh, with uh, flexible template design so that you can add additional values which you may require in the future in order to report those things which you are not naturally collecting today. When it comes to um, 
correction factors for reefers, an example, you may want to get more details about your reefer cargo transported on board, and that should be easy to add to the reporting tool. So daily dashboards and notifications shall ensure that you have an up-to-date monitoring of the fleet, so you are not creating any data gaps, data are complete and also verified. Automatic data interface to any verifier shall just ensure to submit the data on a button click. So don't spend that much time to grabbing the data together, putting them in different forms, and Excel sheets, copy them from A to B. So a button click should ensure that you can submit the data to the verifier you have in place. All that are key things on the reporting and data collection side, which we summarize here as monitoring parts. Looking now into the next chapter, which is the prediction, is as I said, you know where you will in the future based on the predictions and based on applying the upcoming regulations, but still using the year-to-date data, uh, because what you're collecting is historical information. And if we do a simple prediction, we take historical data and we apply the upcoming regulations, which gives you the possibility to constantly predict the current situation into the future. But still, it doesn't take into account any plans you may have in order to change the vessel operation or efficiency in the future. That brings us actually to the third column, which is the simulation. So simulating the CII development based on operational estimations for speed and charter parties, an example, um, shall take into account and give you a simulated prediction, which can actually say, hey, if you change certain things in the operation of the vessel, example, given you have a charter request coming in with a certain speed, you would like to simulate the speed for that vessel into the future and see what effect does that have actually for the CII. That said, we can also take advantage from a database of voyages and CO2 recordings we have from the past. Um, as said, since 2019, everybody is collecting those uh, relevant information, but majority of our clients are actually collecting this data far, far longer. Since uh, collecting fuel and uh, operational data about vessels via reporting systems is already in place since several years. And if we collect all this data, we can basically take advantage of the historical information regards the CO2 emissions which have been produced on certain legs in the past, and we can use them for any simulation into the future. So technologies like machine learning give us advantage uh, to utilize the information and do predictions based on that. The influence of technical fleet performance optimization should, of course, also be taken into account. So if you plan a significant change, if you plan a significant increase of performance in terms of the main engine or uh, high performance optimization example given, uh, you should be able to take that into account for your simulation as well. It should be flexible. Various scenarios uh, and options may be considered. And, uh, you should look at that in parallel. So not sticking to only one simulation, but maybe having two, three, four, five scenarios which you plan with in order to find the best one and get the maximum out of the business uh, while staying compliant. From the best practices towards the holistic approach to emission reduction, I would like now to give you a little bit of an example actually of uh, how this could look like, and uh, also look a little bit deeper into a specific area. Because when it comes to vessel optimization, of course, there are many influence factors. Um, so we have the alternative fuels on the market. We have, of course, um, a speed control, which we have on the vessel. And this is a, it's a very important factor, uh, especially in the, in the business between the charterer and the vessel owner um, to, yeah, kind of agree on a certain speed range which the vessel can operate in while not uh, being too fast, thus contributing too much uh, to the fuel consumption and CO2 emissions. So speed control will, of, of course, be one of the major things on the operational side uh, to control the CII in the future. But also we have uh, technical things like preventive maintenance on the engines, we have the term optimization, and we have, as an example, given the hull performance, which is the one I would like to dig in a little bit further here. On all these areas, optimization potential is there. And on all these areas, we can work with data in order to find optimization potential, which at the end of the day contributes to lower fuel consumption, thus lower emissions as well, and give you possibility to stay within the required ranges for CII. Why I'm taking high performance as one of the examples today, and actually I could talk days with you about different other measures and areas here, um, but high performance raised the interest again in the recent um, 
yeah, in the recent days, um, there was a nice article at the Maritime Executive uh, where an IMO study was published, which showed a higher than expected fuel cost from fouling. And I was pretty um, surprised that I saw based on that analysis that they realized a potential up to 25% of performance optimization just out of certain high conditions. Of course, this might be extreme examples, this might be under extreme conditions, but even if you just talk about the half or even the quarter of that, um, the savings can be significant. And that actually brought me to the point to take high performance as an example today um, to look at uh, potentials we can identify based on data in order to reduce the uh, fuel consumption on the vessel by increasing the efficiency uh, quite significantly. One challenge which we are facing today with our customers is that in order to get a good idea of the current high performance, we need a nice and accurate reference model of the vessel's shape, actually of the vessel's high resistance. These reference models could be done classically, example given by uh, CFD simulations or from sea trials or towing tank tests. All that on the one hand uh, is quite costly to get. It's not available for all vessels, especially for the older ones. And also this is not the truth over time since the vessel will get deformations, damages, et cetera, which are changing the vessel tile and which also, also will change the reference line. So basically, uh, the approach here is that we create such reference muscle based on clean hull data, which we get from the vessels. Example given, uh, after a hull cleaning or a dry docking, we start the data collection period, collect data over a certain time. Um, so we have input information about the vessel's condition uh, in terms of draft, trim, speed. Uh, also, we can include the weather as a very important factor here as well. That put into a machine learning model will actually generate you a predicted shaft power, which we can compare with the following data, which we collect of the vessel, which includes the actual shaft power. Comparing actual shaft power regard to the prediction, which has been estimated based on the clean hull data set we collected in a certain time, will actually identify a speed power, um, a speed loss or a, speed, a shaft power increase, um, depending on how you look at it. And this actually identifies your potential. So the entire system is, of course, far more complex than it's visualized here, but I hope that this gives you an idea of how these things actually are set up in order to get a proper prediction for expected power at a certain condition of the vessel, comparing that with the actual information and identifying the potential you have to save. And I have a next slide, which gives you a little bit an idea of that uh, business case and how that looks into the tool. So hopefully this is a bit easier than to grab rather than the technical explanation behind it. What you can see here is on the y-axis, the speed loss of the vessel. And on the x-axis, you can actually see the date, it's a time range. So here data have been collected in order to generate a high model. And you can see this little break, which I've highlighted in green, uh, which shows you a 1.1 efficiency improvement here, 1.01. Um, so the reference period has made a prediction for the speed loss of the following period. And based on the actual data being collected, uh, we can calculate um, the speed loss of the vessel. At a certain point in time, and this is the one where we have the green uh, cycle here, uh, a hull cleaning was applied to that vessel. And that is actually real data. So based on the machine learning model, we could identify a sp efficiency increase here of 1% after the hull cleaning. Coming back to the IMO study, there's even a far higher potential, but I wanted to show you real data here. So this is data of a real vessel, which we have collected. And this is also based on a real machine learning model, which we have done. So I want to take that example, even that it's showing only 1%. On a vessel which consumes an average 130 tons a day, it still leads us to $260,000 savings, which are possible with that vessel. So it has a immediate business value, but on top of that, it of course contributes also to the increase of your CRI rating because it will reduce the emission. This is one practical example how technical vessel performance can contribute to the CII. And as Carl introduced, we are currently working on a tool which allows you also um, to take that into account into a CII simulation into the future. And 
as said in the beginning, it's only one of the many factors taken into account. And one of the many, let's say, um, angles you could look at performance optimization and you can look at emission reduction. The next screenshot is showing you the CRI simulation part. So on the operational side, we have the variables like speed consumption, um, cargo weight and utilization of the vessel, which are coming more or less from the daily business, uh, from the uh, operational level between charters and owners, where charter contracts are being negotiated. Uh, here, we will, may want to predict into the future if we have a certain speed uh, for the vessel, which we, which we are uh, trying to agree on, if we have a certain um, utilization of the vessel, which we are planning uh, for a certain uh, service. So these are operational variables to be taken into account, where you can basically set your expectations, very flexible, uh, for certain uh, for for certain slots, let's say um, during the running year, um, so it's not limited to one value a year. It basically gives you the option, uh, the option or the possibility to split the year into um, certain slots uh, where you can change those figures in order to make your simulations. On the other hand, more the long-term things uh, are the performance variables. Um, High performance, as just shown, is uh, an existing functionality which can contribute to reduce the COI, similar to main engine or auxiliary engine performance, an example. When correction factors coming up, of course, they also play a role here. So also this is something which shall be taken into account in order to do the simulation. What you can see here is uh, the simulation of CRI in three different areas. Um, and it shows you a comparison of the projected CRI towards the actual CRI. I, Vaida, I have a question. I get a screen popping up here that I can share my screen. Do you still see my screen? Yep, yep. Okay, good. Then I will just ignore that message. Thank you. Um, so this is basically uh, the approach which we are working on, uh, taking into account operational as well as technical optimization when it comes to um, the simulation of the CII. One more thing I wanted to show is that for most of the vessels, we already have historical data being collected over time. So there are many, many things being available which uh, technologies like machine learning can utilize in order to do proper predictions. Uh, one of the things is I call it lag-based CO2. It basically means that we have data over years uh, for several legs, which uh, different vessels in, in, in different sizes and vessel types already have sailed. And we have a lot of detailed data. We know the duration, the distance of the legs. We know the cargo being transported. And we also have already calculated that time, the CO2 emitted. Um, so those are all things which can be utilized in order to make some learnings and predictions for the future. So just want to take that as a second example of how historical data uh, can be of, of advantage uh, for future simulations and can uh, hopefully help um, to kind of follow that very strict and new approach of the upcoming regulations. That said, I would actually like to give you a little bit of a summary and overview how we at Nevis are addressing that topic uh, with our Blue Tracker suite. Um, so on the one hand, a reporting system with a flexible template designer where you can adapt the templates by yourself according to your needs. Uh, certified for DCS data collection, so you can make sure that the data foundation is correct. Um, coming along with a feedback module for the crew, because at the end of the day, uh, crew takes a lot of the corrective action, so they should be involved in that, available for all vessel types by an easy installation. Um, on the other side, having uh, Blue Tracker 1 as the shore side basis, the analysis module, it's a classical fleet performance and compliance tool, so it has a lot of functionalities apart from the smart hull modeling, which I just explained, um, regards to engine performance, weather routing, uh, ship waste management, loop oil monitoring, and, and other things. All those um, are available functionalities which we'd like to combine with our CRI module, where we talk about monitoring, prediction, and simulation, as, such, as uh, just said. And on the simulation side, uh, multiple scenarios, like base CO2 available uh, from historical data, and giving you the possibility to simulate with changing operational as well as um, technical variables. That actually brings me um, to my last slide upcoming, which are the key takeaways of today. So 
to get prepared and to keep uh, with the highest emission compliance standards uh, over time. Um, we actually believe that the highest data quality is necessary in order to monitor the CRI emissions from a reliable data set and stay ahead of the regulations. Um, being aware of future ratings so that you uh, always know where you are and when you have to take corrective actions, but also have a reliable data modeling. Uh, example given utilizing technology like IIML, um, use it to um, simulate whatever your plans are and to see what's the effect of the plan uh, in terms of the of the upcoming things, of the upcoming regulations. Um, this all together brings us to an agile path of future compliance uh, to always be able to prepare the balance of cargo operations and vessel analysis um, according to the evolving situation um, in the in the regulatory area of um, CO2 emissions. Oh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, Carl, I think we still have uh, enough time for some nice Q and A. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, I've certainly got about a lot of questions here, and uh, if we've got any. Uh, Questions from the audience. This is a time to, to put them in. Um, I mean, what, one thing that came to mind. I mean, going in a sort of slightly different direction, but the, the skill set from shipping companies we're looking for. So, shipping companies don't generally employ data scientists, and a lot of this looks quite difficult. But uh, it's also it's not a case that you can just get the software to do it because there's all these different calculations going on. I, I guess you're providing. We imagine in the future you're going to provide a sort of range of tools for getting the different answers, but they have to look at everything separately, fuel, speed, hull, and maintenance. I don't know if you ever want to share some thoughts about how you see this would be sort of managed practically over the next few years within a shipping company. Is that a, yeah, is uh, absolutely. Thanks for that question. That, that's absolutely true. And uh, what, one thing I hear um, from, from many of the shipping companies is that they say, hey, um, look, uh, I have so many nice tools, but I don't have the time to work with them, right? So uh, this is where, where many uh, people are struggling because you still have a, a running operation. Um, so you have a daily business, which you have to uh, fulfill somehow. And uh, this is, of course, your, your key. Um, you have to run your business. And uh, you, you have not the time to spend a lot of uh, additional uh, time on special toolings, which, uh, which are yeah, giving you some possibility to analyze things. And that's exactly why, uh, why we do think we should, uh, we should automate as much as possible and we should make it easy. Um, example given on the, on the EMU DCS, uh, a thing we, we had a recent webinar with, with you guys a year ago, uh, where we talked about submitting of EMU DCS data and a, a customer of us um, told that 80% savings could be reached just by automating that process and submitting data on a button click. Um, so we are looking to automatic alerts and to assist the customer with smart tools as best as possible so that decisions can be made fast and that not that many time is needed to sit in front of the screen and do the analysis because as you said scenarios are very complex and you cannot look into each and everything um, because you require a lot of people the entire day working only on data and and customers are not data our customers are shipping companies they are not data scientists so i think that's exactly correct and i think that's the way uh we need to identify the the best solutions um to to automate this and to relieve customers from that work yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, you just said, I suppose the whole cleaning time that always comes up as one of the biggest decisions or most useful value adding decisions a shipping company can make. So that's maybe the most useful. If there's a sort of suite of different tools people are going to use, that perhaps that's the most useful one in the future or something similar like a, something investing in the propeller or something like that, isn't it? I suppose that's kind of a how we, how, the, how we think this is going to be done, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then there's this database of CO2 records. So that was quite interesting. But I suppose you, you, you're not providing, you're not sharing different companies' data, or are you anonymizing it and sharing? Or is it all? Uh... No, that, so, so that's correct. Uh, the, the IMO does. Uh, the IMO, when, when data are uploaded, uh, I don't know, uh, they, are, they are sharing the, uh, the CO data. So we have a CO, uh, CO2 database there. Uh, but this is not based on LEX, right? So this is based on the annual data which has been submitted to the IMO DCS system. We have it in far more detail, but we have it only, uh, or we use it, we utilize it uh, only on behalf of the customer. So a customer has the possibility to upload uh, historical data. If he uses our system or not, it doesn't matter. He can upload the historical data into, into our system and can utilize all the data um, the customer has um, based on their own records. Um, that's, that's, that's a very important point here, not sharing the public, but making it available for the customer to work with their own data in a, in a fully automated way. Wow, that's very good. Well, we've got uh, three questions on the board here, so I guess we'll, we'll start at the top. So Hakan Dallin, I think, is a Vice President of Global Sales with Bass Software. So he's asking about implementing the system on board the ship. I mean, I suppose you, you, we didn't talk about 
data gathering at all? I mean, I, I suppose that's kind of separate in a way, or you just use whatever the shipping company has, or what? Because well, ships are different in what they're providing. Is that what? A... Yeah, very, very good point, and I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, of course, um, yes, you are right. Um, that's basically a separated thing from our point of view. On the one hand, we have the analysis, and the system, let's say does not care, does not technically technically care uh, from where the data comes. So it could be existing data source on both the vessel, which has just been connected via the API. But of course, we're also offering an example given the Bootstrap reporting tool to, to collect data. And those implementing on board is pretty easy. It's a, it's a self-service. The customer can just deploy the software uh, from the shore site uh, in an automated scripted way. It's a lightweight application, uh, which gives already a, a very good validation of data while keying them in on board. And this is actually uh, the way how customers can add vessels on their own very quickly. Uh, and very flexible. And also it offers powerful designer in order to adapt the templates and, and uh, yeah, to adapt the data collection according to the needs. Because what we want to avoid, and, and you introduced myself uh, as a seafarer, seafaring background, I, I was the one filling out those reports on board. And what I don't want to have is three, four, five, six reporting systems on board just to cover the next and the next and the next regulation. I want to have one system where I key in all necessary information. And if a bit more is required, okay, I add a bit more. But I don't want to have a reporting system for the charterer, a reporting system for the owner, and a reporting system for whatever. So actually, I would like to have it simple also on board. And that's actually what we are addressing. But you are right, it's a decoupled thing. So if data collection is in place, data can be submitted to the analysis part. Well, what about um, how, how custom is your system? Because you've presented it as software, which implies you're making the same software for every customer. Every shipping company is different, isn't it? But you, I guess there must be a lot of customization involved, which I suppose Navis would do, is it? Yeah, exactly. That's the that's that's the key, the customization, and the, and that's what we what we designed pretty flexible. Uh, so the customer has a lot of options to adapt the design and the content by themselves, uh, just using a very uh, modern UI UX approach uh, where we have a designer where the customer can adjust the template and roll it out to the fleet according to their needs. There are a few things, of course, required so that the system is able to run. We have IMO DCS MRV certification in the system, so certain fields needs to be in there, but other fields can just flexibly be added by the client. Oh, very good. So we go to Richard Marioff, who's a consultant with Idealship in Hamburg. So I was trying to write formulas on my piece of paper while he was <laughs> saying this. He's talking about the, the difference between improvement in speed loss means improvement of fuel efficiency. I was thinking if, if it's a car, the fuel efficiency is kilometers per litre and the speed loss is going from 20 kilometers an hour to 15 kilometers an hour. But I don't know if there's any <laughs> going to get into this. I'm, I'm not sure if I get it right, but um, actually the... Um, the uh, speed loss in, in the in the in the high performance area is is uh, similar to a power increase. So what we actually do is we look at a certain operational area of the vessel. So the vessel has a certain speed, it has a certain uh, trim, it has a certain draft, and then we look at what is the power which we based on the model, the power which we need in order to to, to do that operation, and then we compare compare this with the actual power. And if there's difference, we can actually see, oh, we are using more power than actually is necessary based on the model. And the impact um, it will, will be the high performance. So in order to get back to the uh, to the original value, um, the, the hull uh, should be clean, that the propeller should, should be polished. So hull and propeller are always together, of course. Uh, we cannot distinguish that, but but this is basically what, is, what the power increase says. Speed loss is the same thing, looking from a different angle. That, that we take power as an input and we look what's the expected speed. And then we compare the expected speed with the power. So these are the two angles which companies look at uh, power increase and speed loss. They, they go hand in hand and they're actually the same thing, just different angle of view. Yeah, it depends, that answers what, the, the question. depends what speed you're going at as well, how they, how they compare, yeah. I guess. Oh, very good. So Sergio Parelli from uh, Yoten. So he, he's asking, converting the improvement in hull performance to improvement in CII, but I guess you've got to look at the uh, the bands, which are, I mean, it's not an obvious question, you know, I guess you'd, you'd have to track the bands that IMO make to see where you get to, I suppose. I don't think you can really answer this one. I don't know if there's any <laughs> any thoughts you want to give on. Yeah, I have uh, I have some, I have some thoughts. I, I think I get uh, I get from where this where this comes, and this is actually what we're currently working on. Um, so we have the we have to flip uh, the high performance as one of the use cases, and it con contributes um, somehow to the optimization of the vessel. Um, so if we say, example, given uh, one percent is what we uh, what we expect as a potential. Um, result of a high cleaning based on our based on our uh, modeling, um, then we can actually go to the CRI simulation and we can say, okay, um, we take the year-to-date situation of the vessel, and for our future, we would like to apply uh, apply one percent of fuel savings 
uh, in the in, because we get it from the high performance area. And what we actually plan is to have to give you multiple options there, saying okay, high performance is one, um, management performance is the second one, and of course your operational data can also be entered. And then you can just say okay, based on my year to date situation, next year I will be one percent better because of the high performance. I will be two percent better because I have some plans on the engine performance. And that effect actually will then be used to calculate the, the simulation of the CRI. So I hope that gets a bit more clear, um, but, but of course I'm happy to, to dig deeper into this functionality as well uh, on, a, on a separate session where we can um, yeah, have a look at the screens as well. Well, I think what's interesting here is how shipping companies would practically work with this, because I guess what you'd really like to know is if I clean the hole now, am I going to be D at the end of the year? But it's very hard to get an answer like that because you're using two totally separate systems at once, but we can, with your system, make it easier to get data, which we can use to make predictions on the CII Exactly. That, that's the key. So the data are there, and the and the system is utilizing it, and it's basically bringing the the uh, expected performance optimizations together with the CRI um, simulation for the future. That's that's exactly the point, and that's what we try to achieve. That that basically customers give good um, give customer a good guidance, a good overview of of where the CRI will be in the future, um, taking into account all the measures planned. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you run a shipping company, you're going to get pretty intimate. Well, if you're in vessel performance with these bands and your gram CO2 per whatever capacity isn't it or this is based on cubic meter or something isn't it i guess you're going to be looking at these graphs quite a lot and <laughs> there's no way to make that simpler with software that easily is it i suppose because it's all a yeah as i said doing all that stuff manually is of course a very complex thing and uh, uh, yeah it will it will consume too much time so that's why we're working together with our clients currently we have a, a lot of trials uh, ongoing as you said with key customers working on on the next steps and uh, that's exactly what we do so we we get the input from the from the daily business of the customer and we 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 are aiming to help to make life easier by utilizing the technology and and do such things uh yeah more convenient in a good overview dashboard uh, and ui and not um, yeah, spending too much time on the manual analysis there. Oh, very good. So this is another question from Richard. I don't know if this is a sort of a trick question. So I think he's referring to your graph when you said by hull cleaning, we see a fuel efficiency of 1%. He's asking how you translate that into speed loss, but I suppose it would depend on the on the ship, would it? I suppose that's probably quite hard to answer, is it? it actually, what we have seen, uh, what we see on the graph, was a, was a speed loss, in fact. Uh, but of course, uh, a speed loss is of uh, is also translating into into fuel efficiency right away. So, uh, if I have to spend um, a certain additional power, uh, and I um, I know the gap, uh, basically I know the in, the increase of power, I can use the SFOC curve. So, how many how many grams per kilowatt hour I need to spend uh, from that engine, and then this translates into the fuel consumption. So, it's basically uh, a connection which has to be made um, between the fuel um, the fuel consumption per kilograms. Um, a kilowatt hours um, of the specific engine um, uh, coming from the from that speed log so to get back to to fuel efficiency. So there there are certain things in between, um, certain efficiency steps in between, uh, but somehow uh, at the end of the day it all contributes to to um, to fuel efficiency. So I wanted to simplify this a bit in that in that use case. Okay, so we've got this uh, question from Anton Zakharov. Um, well, we do get these questions quite a lot about. Um, gathering data i think it must be the massive challenge that companies have so we're talking about the whether you're going to use auto logging for fuel or rely on the noonday report and if you need an auto logging to do this but i suppose because this is must be the challenge every company seems to have this this challenge done in do, do you want to share even though we're talking about we're not talking about monitoring we're talking about simulation but i guess we're going to talk about the sort of data you need to make a good simulation which is, i think is what the interest is in so do you want to share thoughts on yeah, I, kind of fuel I, data you need. I definitely can. Um, of course, monitoring is, is, as I said, still the key and a good uh, and a good database. And I know that many companies are still struggling today, um, depending on on what they use. Um, still, I see Excel sheets in place. Um, this is almost almost possible nowadays. I would say to to get a uh, valid um, data foundation here. Uh, on the one hand, it's the reporting system which should be uh, should get reliable data. But on the other hand, also of course, uh, automated data is uh, is a data source. Um, so collecting data on board of vessels directly from sensors. And and this is what we bring together on the shore side. So we, we connect um, to reporting systems, let's say as per default, as a minimum database. But if measured data are available from any system, they also can be uh, feeded into the system. And then um, things get complex and we could have a separate session on, on, on that aggregation side. But um, you can just imagine uh, a, a, a data, a report from a vessel um, comes in every 24 hours, measured data every five minutes. Um, 
weather forecast every three hours. So all, all of them have different time ranges and you need to bring them together. So you need to aggregate the data uh, to certain portions which you can really uh, compare, and com compare and combine. And that's very important. And not every data source is giving you everything. Measured data gives you a high frequency, reliable data if the sensors are correct, correctly calibrated, um, but certain things are missing. So certain things can only be be gathered from other data sources. Um, things like fuel details uh, from the bunker receipts, uh, information about the crew itself and so on. It's not measured what's the name of the captain. Um, so reporting and measured data needs to be brought together in a sensible way. And that's something we also support and something we, we, um, we do with our clients uh, to help them to have a really valid and complete data foundation to work on. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the digital architecture for this, do you envisage companies going to be using lots of different tools or they're going to have one software yes. which does everything in the future i don't know if that's a exactly and and the approach is to to harmonize these data and we do that with a with a so-called api first approach a technical term but at the end of the day it means there's a central let's say let's call it the gateway where all the data comes in and behind is the aggregation the harmonization so that we make sure we can combine these data sources and that's the important fact because we also clients don't want to lose existing data right if you have three four five six data sources you don't want to stick with uh, just a new one so you want to have the historical data being utilized and that's very important especially for the prediction as more data we have as better it is um, so historical data should be taken into account and we can uh, we can combine them by by creating interfaces between systems and that's a very important approach yeah i guess you've been doing a lot of these simulations over the past year or so so you must got a lot, a lot of expertise about which <laughs> ships are good at being able to make simulations or I guess Absolutely. So. We, we, have, we have teams which, which are running on board and uh, which are engineers which are installing automatic uh, collection systems. Um, they have a lot of experience in the, in the interfacing uh, area and also on the reporting side, of course, uh, over the past years, we, we got um, lots of um, experience, let's say, and how the different data structures look like and what you can really use and what's more difficult to use. And, and there, are, there are nuances with distinguishing things um, yeah, and which are quite a quite important. Um, so, of course, we have a good experience on that and we're also happy to to offer any consulting as it area. Yeah, I think Anton is with a company called iGage in Paris, which specializes in data gathering, which is why it's a lot, a lot of interest. But I think there's a lot of interest in general about all of this. So, I mean, the second question is also very interesting. How important is it to get real-time data? I think every ship has connectivity. I don't know why he says if there's no contiguity on board, but it could be like delayed since there's an email attachment rather than data sent every 10 seconds. I, I wouldn't have thought. Yeah, getting real-time data is that important, is it? Yeah, uh, it's uh, on the one hand, it's uh, it's important. On the, on the other hand, it's not enough. Um, so that's what I'm saying. That uh, most of the uh, of the sensor data are uh, quite good, quite high data frequency, and of course you have to take into account delays and so on. Um, that that should be handled by the by the data collection system. But once you get access to the data and the sensors are are calibrated, um, you get a very high frequency and high quality data, and that's very important, especially if we talk about simulation, prediction, model building. Um, as more data we have, as better it is. So um, models we built based on measured data are very uh, yeah uh, it's, it's it's you can create models quite fast because you have a huge amount of data quite early um, that's important on the other hand uh, certain things are just simply not available by sensors uh, and also uh, certain things should maybe be better reported rather than um, measured an example given if you talk about the vessel's draft um, so there are some physical limitations in the in the sensors um, that leads to situations that we um, fall back in those in those things um, to take reported data and then the key is again the aggregation bring the data together in the right way that's the important thing wow okay we're getting lots of uh, questions from your competitors in here but i think it's all uh, interesting Pe peggy parcher i think is from Helen Tech in uh, in Athens, but she's asking about exceptions to the CIR calculation stuff in the draft stage. I think that's stuff like the reefer exception. Will your system calculate them? I suppose your system can calculate it as soon as we know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first of all, I'm, I'm happy to exchange with, with any capital as well, no problem. <laughs> so we have a lot, most, most of them are friends to me as well. So if we meet on conferences, of course, we exchange and we talk. And it, it shows the interest in the market, right? It shows, uh, it shows the interest of, of clients to, to talk uh, with, with those companies. So that's, that's totally fair. Um, and yes, uh, the exceptions are, are yeah, drafted, not yet, not yet clarified, but we, we work with the drafts. We, um, we exchange with, uh, about the draft with our clients. And uh, we, of course, um, want to take it to that, uh, into account. So we are supporting the flexibility on the data collection side. And we also want to support uh, taking that into account in the CRI aggregations and simulations. Um, but we are not yet there. Let's say the IMO is not yet there. So we're looking ahead uh, for the upcoming months uh, to get that uh, in stone. And, um, we are aware of that and yeah, working on the front line, let's say. 
Oh, okay. I'd, I'd like to ask you a bit more about this database of CO2 records. So we're talking about, so if you're a company, you, you've got records of how much you emitted on a certain voyage in the past. I suppose you have to have a fleet of a certain size to do this and the ship's all going to be quite similar. I mean, I suppose we heard of a company that said they, they put this thing on the propeller, this I can't remember, boss cap fin on the propeller and that was the best thing they'd ever done. But I mean, not every company can, can do this or it's quite hard to do, but maybe it's something every company would do gathering data over time because it's immensely useful. I, I don't know if you want to share some more thoughts on this sort of history of CO2 data and how companies should work with it, do you think? Yeah, of course. Um, so first of all, we, 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 um, we are gathering the data based on uh, per vessel, so on an IMO number base. And for certain things, it only uh, is possible to look at spe specific vessels. Actually, you could say every vessel is different, even though they are sisters. Usually, there are minor differences still, uh, either on the dead weight or on the engine specifications or something like that, so that you have a real complete sister is, uh, yeah, rarely the case and uh, also is, over time vessels get adapted right so vessels will not um, stay as they are just right off the dry dock so um, usually there there will be um, things changing over time um, so um, you should always look at a, at a specific vessel if you want to dig into certain details but of course there are things which you can look let's say um, at fleet-wide, at least for, the, for a specific vessel class. Um, so you can have a look which vessel is similar, comparable, and um, sometimes uh, it's, yeah, a look into, into data which are near to the real situation of a certain vessel will still be helpful. Um, so not everything, there are certain things we, we should not really stick to, example, given model building, you should stick to the specific vessel, but there are certain things like CO2 databases where you can get at least an idea. Uh, if, if a similar vessel of the same class uh, was doing uh, the same voyage or a very, very similar voyage just to one, one port more or something, so you can still get an estimation which you can take as a baseline. Um, so having, having at, that, at that specific point, having something might be better than having nothing. So um, that's the approach here. Um, so aggregation is possible, not ever, not always said to. Yeah, it's probably good advice to a company to start building their database as soon as, poss as possible if they haven't already and make data they, they can go look back in in 10 years, I suppose, isn't it? And, uh, and the more data exactly. you have. And, and, and what I think is, is is that you need the data really in a structured system, which is able to, to utilize it, uh, because if you just dump the data somewhere in a store and keep it in your, keep it in your shelf, then you will, you will never make use of it, right? So we have nowadays this data being collected and uh, it's time to use it. And it would also be useful if shipping companies would agree to share it because it's in their mutual interest. I don't know if a company like Navis would coordinate this or go through the regulators, but I mean, the more it's useful to everybody to know all this stuff, isn't it? I think. And yeah. Sort of, yeah. I fully agree. Yeah. yeah, that's very good. Uh, another point I wrote down, you had an earlier slide where you mentioned charter parties and speed, but I wasn't sure what, are you talking about optimizing for a certain voyage or are you talking about the, the, the rule in the charter party that says what, speed you have to go at, is it? Yeah, this is a very, very um, frequently discussed uh, thing at the moment um, with our clients we, we, um, when it comes to, to contract, and we work with both. We work with shadow with liners, but we also work a lot with ship managers and owners. And this is on both on both sides because the, the CRI is, uh, is a result of the uh, of the fuel consumption. And the actually at the end of the day, the charter operates the vessel, the charter gives the speed instructions to the vessel. Um, so, uh, it is it is, has an impact uh, on, the, on the charter party so uh, just imagine um you you as a vessel owner as a vessel manager you're chartering out the vessel for the first half of the year and uh, you're chartering out the vessel in category a um or let's say more realistic let's say in c um and you charter this out and you get back the vessel from the charter in the middle of the year in category f um so you have only six months back left and you need to get the vessel out of this situation right and one measure which is pretty effective is reducing the speed. But if you just charter the vessel in the second half of the year on a, on a very low, just in order to keep the CII, um, you will of course get lower weights. So this is a significant impact to your business. So you would like to take the charter somehow in charge to give you back the vessel in a similar category as you gave it to him in January. So uh, these things are being discussed at the moment and it's, I think not yet, there, there's not yet a, a clear path on how this will went into charter contracts or something like that. But this is something currently discussed in the market quite a lot. And CI will have a significant impact on that business relation between charters and owners. And that is something we are currently discussing with our customers quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, it sort of adds another layer of complexity to all of this. I mean, it's hard enough to work out if you should clean the hull now, but to work out what that implies in terms of the ratings or returns from the charter, or I suppose you're just talking about speed mainly, I suppose, speed with the charter party. So going slower if that 
I guess it's yeah. You know, this stuff gets more and more complicated by the day. You just need to think absolutely, it. absolutely. It will be it will be pretty disruptive thing in, in 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 that market. I'm pretty sure this will have a significant impact on both sides. And uh, yeah, I'm 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 really um, I'm really interested following these uh, these discussions at the moment um, and and where this goes. Uh, but definitely, the the significant business impact is is clearly uh, in, indicated now. Oh, oh, it sounds great. Well, um, we're coming to the last few minutes. There's no, no more questions on, on the board here. Um, I don't know if you want to live some last words. We you haven't said anything about what, what companies you're working with. I don't know if that's all confidential or you can say if it's a container ships or tankers or something like that, or, or you want to say when this is going to be on the market or... Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we have already our, our first uh, beta version of the CRI monitoring and prediction part uh, online in production. So everyone who wants to trial is, is uh, we are, we are uh, welcoming him. Um, we're working with all vessel types. There's no limitation on that. Um, so we as Nevis um, have a natural, um, natural background in the container industry, but we are working with all vessel types. So there's no limitation in that regard, especially on the CRI, all types are supported. Um, and yeah, the, the beta version can already be trialed and tested. And on the simulation part, we are currently working, but we'll launch the first version of the simulation as well in Q1 next year. Um, so we are, we are happy with uh, every early adapter who would like to join us on this journey and help us developing um, the right features uh, into that area as well. Okay, so you're inviting companies to contact you and join the trial. Is that what I absolutely heard? yes, please do so. Um, as more input, I think we need to work together on that. And as more input that we, uh, as we can get, as better the solution will be at the end of the day. Yeah, no, it sounds great. Well, I think yeah, I can see a pathway. I mean, it's, it's this stuff isn't easy, but having the right tools to help and the right data to help and uh, focus on the goals we're trying to get is where we're going to go. So, uh, yeah, yeah, well, that sounds great. Well, I think I think we can. Uh, finish there. No, thank you very much. It's very interesting. I think it's getting, it is getting clearer to me, even though it gets more and more complicated. It's getting clearer how shipping industry is going to handle this stuff. So I shall uh, pass back to Vida for closing words. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Bastian Genkep from Navis, uh, walking us through how you see the future of emission monitoring and also how shipping companies can address CII requirements. Here at Digital Ship, we are producing webinars for next year. Check the topics that we plan on our website and get in touch if you like to speak or partner with us. We'll see you in 2022. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Oh, Thank you. Bye.